my name's John Smart. Uh, I am the Global Business Agility Lead at Deloitte. I've been at Deloitte for two years. Prior to that, I have a career in financial services and I was leading ways of working across Barclays Bank globally for four years from 2015 to the end of 2018. And I have about 30 years experience of agile and lean ways of working. Um, I started out uh, on the trading floor in investment banking in the early 1990s, and we were naturally agile, uh, called lightweight processes at the time. So for me, this is a little bit like back to the future. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the why and the how to business agility. So first of all, on the why, the 26th of June 2018 was an, import, an important day in history. It was the day that General Electric was removed from the Dow Jones Industrial Average Index. It was the last original remaining constituent. GE had been in the Dow Jones Index for 122 years, from 1896. Only two years previously, it was still in the top 10 of firms by market valuation. Today, 50% of the members of the Dow Jones Industrial Average Index have been in the index for less than 15 years. And there is only one company in the Dow Jones Index that has been in the index for longer than the invention of the microprocessor. So only one company that predates effectively the computer. September 2015, seven of the top 10 firms by market valuation were not IT firms. Fast forward less than two years, June 2017, and seven of the top 10 firms are IT firms. Something very significant happened. Today, it's not any seven, it's the top seven firms accelerated by the pandemic seven of the top 10 firms are information technology firms. And, and actually since Q3, it's now eight firms out of the top 10 firms by market valuation are IT firms. So something very significant has happened. The world of work has fundamentally changed. We've gone from the age of oil and mass production. These are workers in the Ford Model T factory in Detroit. And as you can see, top left, people are making wheels and they're making the same wheels day in, day out, repetitive tasks. Or top right, they're making a petrol tank or a gas tank. People are doing repetitive activity. It's knowable. It's mass production, mass consumption. Um, Henry Gant worked with Frederick Winslow Taylor in the early 1900s. And that's where the Gant chart comes from. The Gantt chart comes from manual labor in factories. And the line in the Gantt chart is, have you shoveled enough today? If you have, you can go home. If you haven't, keep working. Today, however, we're in <clears throat> the age of digital. And increasingly, work is unique and it is unknowable. The activities require collaboration. They require conversation. In the Detroit factory, more than 50 languages were spoken. And that didn't matter because people weren't speaking to each other back in the age of oil and mass production. Now in the age of digital, people need to collaborate. They need to work together. Everything we do is unique. When you think of what's coming off the assembly line, it's not lots of instances of the exact identical same widget. In the context of digital and software, every binary coming off that assembly belt is unique. It's, it's unique, it's unknowable, and people don't know what they want until they have it, and you don't know how you're going to do it until you've done it. Now, when you're writing software, you don't write the same software 100,000 times. You write it once, you realize how you could have written it better, you write it again, and then you run it 100,000 times. So we have more, we're in a more of an emergent domain of work, increasingly. We have a new means of production in the age of digital. This is like going from the Stone Age to the Iron Age. We, we have new tools. There are new expectations being set. So whether this is by traditional competitors or by disruptors, the customer is at the center and there are new expectations. 
So therefore, in order to survive and thrive, it is necessary to adopt better ways of working suited to the change in the type of work and the means of production. However, it's not necessary because, to quote Edward Deming, survival is not mandatory. So the question to ask yourself is, what are you optimising for? Douglas Hubbard, who's the author of How to Measure Anything, looked at the most valuable data for making decisions, for making investment decisions. And what he found is that the most valuable piece of information, first of all, for an investment in a product was, will it be used? If it's not going to be used, it's going to be a complete write off of your investment. Secondly, how quickly will it be used? So time to use was the second most important piece of information. And those two factors trump all other data. They trump who's on the team, the cost benefit analysis, the projected return on investment and so on. So let's look at the flow of value then, the time to value. Most organisations have a flow efficiency of 10% or less. What that means is, is that work is waiting 90% of the time. So in that picture on the left, in the blue, that's where work is being worked on. And in the gray is where work is waiting. And this is common across agile and lean, whether it's unique product development or repetitive operational activities, this applies in both contexts. And when you look at reasons why work is waiting, it could be typically in the context of product development, annual budgeting, steering committee, design committee, a cost review board, resource allocation, governance committee one to 26, and learning and value finally coming in at the end, 12 to 18 months later or 24 months or in one organization I've worked with three years later when we measured this time to value. Yet you speak to IT and people in IT will say, yay, we're agile. Woohoo!" However, that doesn't necessarily improve the end to end time to value. You can improve agile in IT, that, that bit in the middle there, 90 percent. And if you've got impediments to flow upstream and impediments to flow downstream, it's going to have a minimal impact on the end to end flow of value. There's a saying I like, which is impediments are not in the path, impediments are the path. So the trick here is to try to remove the impediments to flow, to alleviate the impediments to flow and have a picture more like the one in the bottom left. And that will give you sooner time to learning, to value, to de-risking, to pivoting, genuine agility and to satisfaction, both colleague satisfaction and uh, customer satisfaction. So the question to ask yourself is, are you optimizing for the fast flow of value? And do you know your flow? And it's surprising how many organizations don't know their flow uh, and are not measuring it. Uh, I like to think that there's a, a shift from productivity to valuativity, uh, which is a made up word. Um, the definition of productivity is the number of units of output per unit of input. And in the context of the age of digital, we don't want to have a feature factory. We don't want to be producing widgets off the end of the assembly line with questionable value. What we do want is we want the most value in the shortest time with the least effort. That's what we should be optimizing for, the most value in the shortest time with the least effort and actually the least output. So it's outcomes over output focusing on the outcomes. It's not about velocity. It's not about doing more because doing the wrong thing, doing more of the wrong thing, doing the wrong thing faster makes you more wrong. So the question is how, how do you get there? I'm gonna share with you eight patterns and anti-patterns. These are lessons learned the hard way. Um, these, are, these are personal learnings, learnings from other people as well. Patterns will give you a tailwind. They'll help you with change. And anti-patterns will give you a headwind. They'll make a hard job harder. And it's important to note that there is no such thing as one size fits all. Um, and there is no such thing as best practice. Rather, there are patterns and patterns which are usually successful or usually will make the job harder. 
So the first one is my number one learning is focus on the outcomes first and foremost. And the the anti pattern here is is doing an agile transformation with a capital A and a capital T. The capital A means you have to do agile whether you like it or not. The capital T means you have to transform whether you like it or not. Um, this is what I did at my previous employer. We ran an agile transformation. I was the head of the agile transformation in year one in 2015. I'm going around telling people you have to do agile whether you like it or not. Some people embrace it and some people will resist that narrative and we're special or we've tried it before or that, that doesn't work here. So my learning is to pivot on the outcomes. Um, so we pivoted to focus on, first of all, better, which is quality, value, which you measure through objectives and key results, and it's unique, and it's why you're in business. It could be retail banking, investment banking, mortgages, equity trading, and so on. Sooner is time to value, time to learning. It's lead time, time to learning, it's throughput, account of the number of items of value over a given period of time, flow efficiency, which we looked at earlier. Safer is continuous compliance. It's agile, not fragile. It's data privacy, anti-money laundering, fraud. It's the regulatory mandatory stuff that needs to be done or your own internal policies and standards. Happier is happier colleagues, customers, citizens, and climate because it's not at any cost to society or to the planet in terms of um, improving ways of working. And in my previous role, after three and a half years, on average, across tens of thousands of people across the organization, we saw a 20 times improvement in quality. So we saw 20 times less failure demand. We saw on average a three times improvement on um, lead time and throughput and flow efficiency. So teams were three times quicker to learn, three times quicker to de-risk, three times less sunk cost fallacy. Uh, we saw a 20 times improvement in the best teams. We saw a positive compliance trend. We saw reduced impact radius when things did go wrong. And subject matter experts were spending 80% of their time proactively instead of reactively. And then for colleagues, we had the highest colleague engagement scores from an independent UView regular colleague engagement survey. So people were the happier, the happiest they'd ever been in terms of more engaging, motivating, empowering, autonomous ways of working. And we saw a positive, a positive client net promoter score trend. And again, the anti-pattern is the top-down mandate of and the capital A, capital T agile transformation, which is what we tried. Um, and it didn't improve the outcomes as much as focusing on these outcomes, measuring them and making the trend in them visible. The second learning is to achieve big through small. Don't achieve big through big. So the anti-pattern here is to think big, start big, learn slow. Um, the pattern is to think big, start small, learn fast. Achieve big through small have an S-curve adoption, keep the gradient to change low to start with. We tried to do too much in year one. So a mistake that I made, a learning, was not to try to do too much. We, had, we tried to have too steep a gradient. And what I have learned is that people have a limited velocity to unlearn and relearn. You cannot force the pace of change. The rule of one, one experiment, one team, one location, get it working, repeat. And then you can start to increase the, the gradient as you, as you prove it in your context. The third lesson learned is invite over inflict, um, not inflict over invite. The anti-pattern is inflicting, mandating change. I've had some business areas where they've inflicted change top down. Um, it didn't lead to improved outcomes. It led to the robotic maneuvers of agile. It led to teams doing stand-ups and sprints and using post-it notes or virtual boards but it didn't necessarily improve the outcomes because it wasn't coming from within. So instead, invite, one size does not fit all, and start with the innovators on the left-hand side of the diffusion of innovation curve. The fourth lesson learned is leadership behavior will make it or break it. Um, there absolutely has to be psychological safety. People need to experiment. 
They need to try new things. People need to be able to have intelligent failure. There's no such thing as a failed experiment as learning. Now, if there's no psychological safety, people will not experiment and they will not improve. So that's this is paramount. I've, again, I've had business areas which have been led through a culture of fear and people have been told exactly what to do. And there's learned helplessness. People are just waiting for the next order. The fifth area is build the right thing. Uh, it was great hearing Flavio in the opening talk about build the right thing and build the thing right. Um, so build the right thing. For me, this is the pivot to product over project, long lived teams on long lived products, on long lived value streams aligned to the customer and outcomes over milestones and outcome hypotheses. The next uh, lesson learned is build the thing right. It's almost like Flavio and I cooperated at the beginning. Build the thing right. Minimal viable compliance. So this, this is my definition. It, this, is, this is governance. This is risk. This is minimal viable compliance. And not having one size fits all. Um, so for one organization that I've worked with, everybody had to comply to 45 artifacts, 22 control gates. Didn't matter what your risk uh, profile was like lowest common denominator. So um, I've done a lot of work in that area to have context sensitive guardrails, minimal viable compliance. The seventh lesson learned out of eight is continuous attention to technical excellence. Go slow to go, go slower to go faster. Um, if you don't go slower to go faster, you will end up going slower, whether you like it or not. Um, this is technical debt. This is agile architecture. This is not having a brittle architecture. This is extreme programming type techniques. Um, not having an agile hollow shell. Doing scrum without technical excellence is not a recipe for success. You will end up going slower. It'll, things will get more brittle and eventually something will break. So there has to be a constant focus to technical excellence, technical debt, process debt, and also cultural debt. And then finally, create a learning organization. The, 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 the goal here is to create a learning organization. Impediments are the path. They're not in the path. It's going from, this is going from impediment to impediment to impediment. So the more that this, this um, can be built into the, the muscle memory of the organization, the better. It's worth looking at uh, the improvement carter and the coaching carter from Mike Rother. Um, this is you know, a role for leaders at all levels in the coaching carter and getting everybody into um, a continuously experimenting and learning. Um, so thank you very much.